this week. Join me as I travel back more than 3,000 years to unearth the true story of Queen Nefertiti. She was the most beautiful and mysterious woman in ancient Egypt. But suddenly, the super queen vanished without a trace. Who was the mysterious Queen Nefertiti? Why did she disappear? Can her mummy still be found today? To find out, I'll follow a trail of clues into Egypt's most sacred and secret places. I'll explore dark tombs, descend a 40-foot shaft of sheer rock, and come face to face with ancient mummies. We're digging for the truth, and we're going to extremes to do it. December 6th, 1912. Egyptologists excavating the city of Amarna make a stunning discovery. They come face to face with one of the most beautiful women in the world, Queen Nefertiti. This magnificent painted limestone bust soon becomes one of the most famous icons of ancient Egypt. It's also a clue in a mystery that captures the imagination of the world. Nefertiti means the beautiful one has come. But where did she come from? And where did she disappear to? Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein, and I'm on the trail of one of the most elusive and alluring women in history, Queen Nefertiti. Most ancient Egyptian royals spared no expense when it came to memorializing their lives. So you'd expect a queen as powerful and beautiful as Nefertiti to have an amazing monument to her memory, wouldn't you? But the view from this balloon shows me that there's nothing in Egypt to remind us of her life or death. No temple, no tomb, no pyramid. Archaeologists found the beautiful limestone bust of Nefertiti here in this 3,000-year-old ghost town. This was once the home of Queen Nefertiti and her husband, the pharaoh Akhenaten one of the most controversial rulers in all of ancient Egypt. Akhenaten came to power in 1353 BC. Before his reign, the center of Egyptian life and power was the city of Thebes. Akhenaten and Nefertiti moved the capital more than 150 miles up the Nile River and built a new city, now called Amarna. There, they started a new religion, unlike anything Egypt had known before. Their court was known far and wide for its fabulous wealth, its mystical god, and its charismatic young king and queen. Today, the city has all but vanished, along with almost every trace of the captivating woman who was once its queen. What could have happened to Nefertiti? Archaeologist Ted Brock is going to help me search for Queen Nefertiti. And what better place to start than the royal tombs of Amarna? While there's not much left of the city above ground, there's plenty to see underground. I'm hoping to find my first clues to the mystery of Nefertiti and her pharaoh husband, Akhenaten. Wow. So Ted, what's this first sight? Well, I thought I'd bring you up here, see uh, this tomb. It's a high priest of Aten named Mary Ray. Mary Ray. Yeah, the one who loves Ray. That's okay. what his name means. Uh, Ted explains that inside this locked tomb is a rare glimpse into the lives of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. Up here we've got uh, an important scene of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. Would you like a light? We are surrounded by stunning images of the king and queen. Ted points out the main characters in each scene. Akhenaten, Nefertiti, there are cartouches up there. And it says Nefertiti. Here's yeah. It. You can recognize over here that Nefertiti by our characteristic crown outlined here. There are also images of the Aten the sun god, depicted as a sun disk with rays coming out of it. Akhenaten and Nefertiti's new religion worshipped the Aten, 
and their religious revolution transformed ancient Egypt. So over here is a more detailed version of the, of the temple rituals, focusing on the royal family making offerings to the Aten. The story of their new religion is literally carved into these tomb walls, as are the more practical and even personal aspects of their daily lives. You're accompanied by Mary Ray, and they're throwing out collars of gold to him, which are removed from here. It really captured every part of their lives. It's a really rich uh, rendition of, of life, and I think that was important to them, to show all details of life. It's like the first reality show. Outside here. Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah, the way. Ted okay. says there's even more just outside the tomb. These statues of Akhenaten and Nefertiti are on one of the boundary stelae that once marked their city's limits. There is some inscription that talks about cutting the tombs for the king, for his wife, Nefertiti, and for the eldest daughter, Meridhaten. So one tomb for each of them. That's what it seems to say. So there'd be three tombs somewhere nearby? At least three tombs, but they wouldn't be nearby. They'd yeah. be way in the desert. It's a long ways away, a long hike up a wadi to reach them. We could go there if we wanted to. Yeah, you could go. Yeah, could go. So let's go for it. The tombs we're heading for are those of the royals themselves. They're about three miles from here. On the way, Ted tells me more about this mysterious woman. Akhenaten gave Nefertiti tremendous power as a queen. This limestone bust is the best known tribute found to date. But it raises some questions. If Nefertiti was one of the most influential women in the ancient world, why was such a beautiful work of art cast aside unfinished? We're now entering the royal tomb of Akhenaten, Nefertiti's pharaoh husband. It was discovered in the 1890s, relatively recently because of its remote location. Yet when archaeologists opened it, the contents they expected to find were already gone. Was it robbed, or did something else happen? The archaeologists who found this tomb removed some of the artwork from the walls for preservation. Akhenaten and Nefertiti's artwork is considered to be as revolutionary as their religion. No other Egyptian nobles were pictured in such scenes of family intimacy and affection. So, These panels are still in this tomb, in the chamber where Ted says their second daughter was buried. Nefertiti's over here, and they're in these postures of mourning with their hands over their heads. The images of them grieving provide rare glimpses of royal vulnerability. Are there other members of the royal family buried here? Yeah, we have a burial place for Akhenaten farther down. The tomb. Finally, we reach Akhenaten's burial chamber. His sarcophagus was found Another here, room smashed. But was Nefertiti buried here too? Yeah. Every here. time I find her image, it's like it's erased. All I see are vague outlines of the unusual shape of her crown. That's right. She seems to be everywhere, except we haven't found her sarcophagus here. There's no evidence that she was ever buried in this tomb. No funeral furnishings for her were found, no depictions of her funeral, nothing to indicate that she was here. Unfortunately, there's not much more that this tomb can tell me. But Ted's given me another clue that Nefertiti's mummy could have been moved to a different tomb. Sounds intriguing. The site is near a place called Dar el Bahri, which is 150 miles south of Amarna in the Valley of the Kings, the giant graveyard of Egypt's greatest rulers. Egyptian pharaohs were often buried in elaborate tombs filled with riches. But the tomb I'm headed for now held something even more precious to archaeologists. Mummies. Tomb raiding was a serious crime problem in ancient Egypt. Kings were vulnerable from almost the moment they were laid to rest. 
Their riches and remains tempted looters willing to descend to the darkest depths of the earth. It was up to the priests to protect the royal mummies. And they came up with a brilliant plan. They started moving mummies. Could this be what happened to Akhenaten and Nefertiti? Is this why their mummies weren't found in the tomb built for them in Amarna? Nigel? Hi, Josh. Nigel Hetherington is an archaeologist familiar with this site. He tells me I'm going to be lowered into the tomb using this winch and cable. It's really dangerous. This rig is hardly ever used. But I'm determined to get to the bottom of the true story of Queen Nefertiti. I'm looking for clues into the mysterious disappearance of Queen Nefertiti. I found some hints of what her life was like in her capital city of Amarna. And I understand this secret tomb in Dar al Bahri could give me some idea of what happened after her death. But it's not easy getting inside here, as archaeologist Nigel Hetherington and I are finding out. Look over here. See that? That's a winch. They're actually going to lower us into the tombs. And they've just rigged up the cables, and they say that it's going to work. This is definitely sketchy. The ropes are frayed, and the belts look like they're about to snap. But this winch is really the only way to get inside this tomb. There's a lot of yelling going on here. Be nice to know what they're saying. This shaft goes straight down into the solid rock, 40 feet deep. Even the toughest Tomb Raider would have had a hard time finding any mummies hidden here. <laughs> to make it even more challenging, the priests fill the bottom of the shaft with rubble, creating yet another obstacle to the mummy's hiding place. I am amazed that anyone would put anything down here. Over here? Okay. A lot cooler down here, that's nice. The last obstacle was a wall at the bottom of the shaft, sealing off the tunnel that led to the actual mummy cache. We can knock our way through. That's what this is for? Yeah. Okay. I just whack away, huh? Yeah, just knock your way through. Today, it's bricked up for protection. But we have special permission to chip through this modern cement wall to see what's on the other side. Oh, sorry. I just hope there's something in there. I feel like the famous archaeologist Howard Carter when he unearthed the amazing tomb of King Tut. He broke through a wall a lot like this one. And when he peered inside, he and his patron had an exchange that went down in history. Ooh. Wow. What can you say, Josh? Uh, wonderful things. Looks like the girl's locker room. <laughs> Hello. Well, it was something like that. So while we're breaking down the wall, maybe you can tell me a little bit, what's in here? Well, nothing now. Um, nothing? Nothing now, but it's actually one of the most important finds ever in Egyptology. The most famous kings of all of Egyptian history. Kings and queens, princesses, Seti the I, Ramses II. So all those people, the biggest and brightest stars of ancient Egypt, yeah. were buried here. They were right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. The priests that moved them, the priests of Amun, took them from the Valley of the Kings, put them here for security. It's okay. The trick is to get in without taking down the ceiling. It may look dark and uninviting, it's not but the, the mummies were safe here for 3,000 years. It's a nice shaft. It, it wasn't until about a century ago big, that like some ten, goat herders ten, chasing nine. a stray animal found this pit and ventured inside. It was a gamble to drop down the long, dark shaft, not knowing what was at the bottom. But they must have known it could pay off big time. And now, onto the tomb. That must have been a pretty spooky experience to be the first person in here to 
Because you know, you come down the shaft, you take out all that rubble, you break through the barrier, then it's just mummies. The goat herders basically had their own private treasure chest down here. Oh, this is cool. And for the next 10 years, they sold artifacts from this tomb on the black market. Wow. wow. Then, in 1881, Egyptian antiquities officials traced the artifacts back to this cache and moved in. And they were just stacked right here. Literally stacked uh -huh. all the way along the corridor here. Just one on top of each other, no order, very random. Stacked to the ceiling, tilted everywhere like a jumble set. Within days, the archaeologists packed up the 53 mummies found in the cache and shipped them off to the Cairo Museum for identification and safekeeping. Wow, the ceiling just collapsed in here, didn't it? Yeah, uh, it's pretty uh, dodgy in here. This is a modern uh, collapse. This? This is but were Nefertiti and Akhenaten in this cache? That's right, yeah. This is the were the Amarna mummies found here? No. There no. were no Amarna period mummies found in here at all. So Nefertiti and Akhenaten do maybe have tombs somewhere. And, and maybe mummies somewhere, but not here. It's That's a what? possibility. Uh, people do think that the Amarna family are together somewhere. So it's possible their mummies were moved just like these were. But where did they end up? Perhaps I can find out more at the museum in Cairo, where the mummies found here were brought. So the next step is to the Cairo Museum. Atla! To Cairo. The Cairo Museum has the world's greatest collection of Egyptian artifacts, and that includes mummies. Maybe Nefertiti and Akhenaten ended up there. I'm on a quest to learn what happened to Queen Nefertiti and her husband, the pharaoh Akhenaten. I didn't find the answer in Amarna, where she lived. But the royal cache has given me a new idea. The mummies buried there ended up in the Egyptian museum in Cairo. Maybe the Amarna mummies are there too. So I'm going to Cairo. After days in the dry heat of the desert, it's nice to be out on the water enjoying the cool breeze. This is a traditional Egyptian sailboat called a felucca. This one, appropriately enough, is called the Akhenaten. I'm hoping that with the guidance of Captain Gadulla, I can get from Luxor to Cairo the old-fashioned way and see what it's like to travel Egypt by the Nile. On the shores of the Nile, it looks like life hasn't changed much since Nefertiti's day. Until we approach Cairo. It may be a modern city, but it holds some ancient secrets. This is the Egyptian Antiquities Museum in Cairo. They have so many relics, mummies, and artwork that they only have room to display a small portion of them. I'm here to meet Dr. Nazri Iskander, one of the world's leading authorities on Egyptian mummies. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Let's see them. I think they're going to bring some mummies out to us, or we're going in. I'm not certain yet. They have a secret storage room that Dr. Nazri has arranged access for me. It's, it's amazing. This is going to be the first time I ever see mummies. I can't believe they're actually bringing the mummies out here into the open air. Dr. Nazri, what is this that we're seeing? Uh, this is the, the mummy of Amenhotep II. I'm in Hunt up the second. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, 3,500 years old. Now, did he have anything in his hands? Uh, we didn't find anything with him. It looks but, like but he may have been holding it. It looks that he had something. Yeah, I'm in Hotep like the second. Dr. Nasri tells me he was the great grandfather of Nefertiti's husband. Yeah. And you can recognize here yep. some of the smallpoxes on, on the, his shoulder and, and his neck. <laughs> he died of smallpox. We don't know, but there is some smallpox on, him, on, this, on the skin. Can I get that right now? No. No? It's okay. <laughs> it's nothing there. Curse of the mummy? Just, just the remains. Okay. That is amazing. It's like he could speak. Hello. It, they all speak to me. They speak to you? Yeah. <laughs> what do they say? What do they say? Keep us in a good way. Yes, take care of me. <laughs> take care of us. Wow. <laughs> How amazing to see the mummy of one of Nefertiti's relatives. And there are lots more mummies where he came from.
This is the storage room for all your mummies? We're at the bottom of a staircase. This is uh, Ramses III. Right. I can't believe it. All these mummies, these are incredibly precious artifacts, and they're being stored temporarily at the bottom of a staircase. So what makes this challenging is that they're labeled on the inside of each uh, container. You think it's this one? So they have to actually open up one container, see who's in there, and then close it and then move them all around. The museum is building state-of-the-art climate-controlled rooms, but these temporary quarters let me get up close and personal with the mummies. You gotta move. This is Ramsey's the third? Ramsey's three. They're looking for the one I really want to see, the remains which may be Nefertiti's husband, Akhenaten. But there's a lot of controversy about whose they really are. So I'm going to get some expert help from someone who's not only well acquainted with Akhenaten, but also with Ted Brock, who showed me the Amarna tombs. This is Lila Brock. Lila is Ted's wife and also an Egyptologist. And Lila, you specialize in the skull that we're actually trying to see. This is very special access that they're giving us. It is. It's unusual. Indeed. You're very privileged. How does this skull or body, uh, what, what evidence does this give us today? Well, of course, everyone's very curious as to whether this is the body of Akhenaten. Okay, so the contents are still questionable? We're not really sure who they belong to? It, it's almost the, the biggest mystery hmm. of the 18th dynasty as to who the skeleton belongs. And you haven't seen the skeleton how long? I haven't seen it since 1986. So it's been almost 20 years? It has. Wow, okay. It sounds like they're ready. So we're going to go in and see what's behind the doors. We're going back to the stairwell. Got to be careful where you put your hands. Ah, wah. It's just the skeletal yes. remains. Not just skeletal. 20 years since someone's seen this, this yeah. whole skeleton. That's OK. Uh -huh. This is, we found it in tomb 55. Yeah. It's pretty amazing to be so close to the skull of someone who lived 30 centuries ago and apparently took his secrets to the grave. This is, is this really Akhenaten's skull? At one point, people thought this was Akhenaten's skull? Probably. Yeah. Nobody knows for sure. There are there's a there's is many a... opinions about this as there are scholars studying okay. the Marnak here. Well, that's good to know. I think we're still studying and we're still studying. And we're still studying. Yeah. So who else could these remains belong to? Lila and Nasri tell me they may be the bones of someone named Smenkare. The plot thickens. Even these experts don't agree. It seems Smenkare was one of the most shadowy characters in all of Egyptian history. We don't know it's Smenkare. We don't really don't know a great deal at all about uh, Smenkare as an individual. Because, of course, there is a missing gaps. Yes. Smenkare could be one of the most important clues to Nefertiti's true story. He appeared on the scene about the same time Nefertiti disappeared. Some scholars believe Nefertiti may have changed her name and become Smenkare. But why would Nefertiti need to change her identity? Nasri is taking me to the coffin where these questionable remains were found. This is the cover of the coffin, which we found some bones. The friends and relatives of Nefertiti are proving a challenge to identify. Is this the coffin of Smenkare? Akhenaten, or someone else. Maybe the markings will tell the story the mummies won't reveal. So tell me what this is? Now, this is a lid of one of the coffins, which we, of this evidence has been destroyed by purpose. I see. And, and even here you see by yourself, the yeah. face is removed. I don't understand. No. Who, removed, who removed the gold? Some other people. Later? Later. Why? Because of, of, of there is against each, each other in politics. Oh, so they've defaced him? Yes. So by removing the, the face, we by don't removing know. removing the face, he has no afterlife. Okay. And also the name of the king is removed. So that's where the name would have been? Yeah. Who told then, us who's inside here? Yes. Who has no face and has no name has no afterlife. So someone Gosh. came in and vandalized this, and they were very specific. They took the face off, yes. they took the name off. So now we don't know that, who was inside it. Yes. And what was in the here? The uh, scepter? Yes, yeah. But you don't have it. You don't have it. Mm -hmm. The person who probably did this yeah. Yeah. took and that too. Also, the names of, of the king must be written on, on this. 
Oh, That's wow. why they removed it. So this is a John Doe. He left only the praise. This is a mummy John Doe. Yeah. It's like we don't know. We have a body, but we don't know who it belongs right, yeah. to. See, that bothers me. Because I'm trying to find out the story, and it seems like the lead characters are erased. But you know, I, I like the mystery in these stories. You like the because, mystery? Yeah, it, it, it keeps it all the, all the way alive. That's why and you're an archaeologist. People asking, yeah. Yes. It's a good mystery. Yeah. It's amazing, now. I feel like I've got more questions than answers. The tomb 55. This really reinforces which how is, hard it is to tell these movies apart. was many times for the rejected persons. And it seems that finding Nefertiti is a particular challenge. I definitely need a fresh perspective. A balloon ride is the perfect mode of transportation for the next leg of my journey, 3,000 years back in time. I'm going to the Valley of the Kings to investigate some more Amarna mummies, including the most controversial one of all. There's a tomb here that dates from the Amarna period, and some believe it may contain Queen Nefertiti's mummy. To get a better view, I'll be going up into the air with Captain Bob. Morning, Captain. Hi, good morning. How are you? And then I'll be going underground with one of the world's premier mummy hunters. I'm floating over the Valley of the Kings in a hot air balloon because this really is the best way to get a view of this amazing place. For centuries, the pharaohs of Egypt outdid each other with grand monuments and tombs. Up here, you really get a sense of how they competed to be remembered for the ages. The tomb I'm heading for now is not much to look at from the outside. It's what's inside that's impressive. It may contain the mummy of Egypt's most beautiful queen, Nefertiti. The tomb in front of me is KV-35. And the man to help me get into it is Dr. Zahi Hawass, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities. As head of the SCA, Dr. Hawass oversees all of Egypt's archaeological sites. But as a field archaeologist, he may know more about the secrets of these tombs than anyone else alive. Hi, Dr. Hawass. How are you? Good morning. Thanks for By the way, this way, the name KV-35 means Valley of the Kings 35. Each of the tombs here has been given a number, which designates the order in which it was excavated. This was originally the tomb of Amenhotep II, the great-grandfather of Akhenaten, Nefertiti's husband. After his death, priests moved a number of Egypt's other kings and queens here for safekeeping. But when archaeologists first excavated it in 1898, they had no idea this was anything but an ordinary tomb. Those are mummies. Real mummies inside. You have to know that this, this wall was completely painted. And this was painted. So it was covered. Covered. And no one really can know that actually behind uh, this door, there is something at all. Inside this room, they found 12 mummies. 12. Now we can bring the yeah. adventure. Well, Follow me. OK. In 2003, another team of archaeologists arrived on a hunch that one of the mummies was none other than Queen Nefertiti. They found enough similarities between the mummy and the elusive queen to announce they had a match. But many Egyptologists believe that there wasn't enough evidence to make that claim. As I learned at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, there can be as many theories about a given mummy as there are scholars. So let's start with the evidence the recent team used to make their claim. Someone says this is Nefertiti because someone cut out her mouth and cut out her chest to sort of disrespect her. And uh, look, there's no penis, so clearly it's a woman. And this hand held a scepter, so therefore it must have been someone who was regal and had a scepter. And the head is shaved, so therefore Nefertiti could wear her crown and she had pierced ears, so she could wear her earrings. And all of that says... Nefertiti. But was it? Many scholars disagree. So I asked Zahi what he thinks. Look at the, the, the mouth. They said someone came with a knife, damaged a part of the mouth, and also damaged a part of the chest. Mm -hmm. She said because this is as a revenge, because everyone hated Nefertiti. If you hate 
Nefertiti. If you if you lived three thousand years ago, Shash, yeah. and you really hated Nefertiti, and you saw her mummy in front of you, yeah. will you really come with a knife and try to do this? Yeah, I probably cut the whole head off. Yeah, because if you want to get revenge from a mummy, you destroy the mummy. Mm -hmm. okay. The second thing, yeah. they they said this is a mummy, a, a part of a female, because it's missing something. But if there is no penis in a mummy, it doesn't mean that this is a female, because King Tut himself lost his penis right after the discovery. After he died. Then now, if you look at the mummy of uh, King Tut, you said yeah. that this is a mummy of a female. Ah, okay. And actually, if you look at this part, And then there was the hand which could have held the scepter. He said that this is a part of Nefertiti, but I don't understand really how this could fit with this mummy. Where does it go? It cannot fit with this mummy. The one hand too many. So that hand probably belongs to a totally different person because there's already an arm on there. Yeah. And therefore, I think, uh, I don't really believe at all that this is the mummy of uh, Nefertiti. But I want you to hold this, okay. the last piece of evidence, which is the most important one. We did a DNA. Okay. We found that this mummy is a mummy of a man. This is not a, a mummy of a female. It is not a mummy of Nefertiti at all. So if this is a Nefertiti, where is she? You know, archaeologists, Josh, who are searching in the Valley of the Kings, they search in Amarna. They do not find the tomb. I really cannot answer this question. But I always say that you never know what the sand of Egypt might hide of secrets. Mm. The sand of Egypt may reveal important evidence about Nefertiti, which we should wait. But what Zahi said implies Nefertiti was controversial, maybe even hated by some. So I'm wondering if this is the reason she's been so hard to find. Did someone want her gone? But who? And why? Maybe I'll learn more at my next stop, the temple of the great queen Hatshepsut, the first Egyptian queen who ruled as king. I've heard that her story could hold some clues to Nefertiti's fate. Archaeologists yeah, Ted and Lila Brock are going to show me around. When did Hatshepsut live? She lived in the late 16th, early 15th centuries BC. It's about a hundred years before Nefertiti? Yeah, that's about right. That's right and Both were beautiful it. and powerful She's queens, but apparently Hatshepsut had higher aspirations. She became pharaoh. Ted explains to me exactly how she achieved this most unusual feat. When her husband, Thutmosis II, died, his heir, Thutmosis III, was still a young boy who couldn't apparently rule in his own right. So Hatshepsut adopted the role as being regent for this king. But after a couple of years, seems to have, for whatever reason, decided to become king herself and ruled for the next 20 years. This is fascinating, though. The whole story of Hatshepsut definitely sets a precedent yeah. for a queen becoming king and effectively ruling. That's certainly but since only men had ruled as pharaoh in ancient Egypt, she stayed in power by disguising herself as a man, the ancient Egyptian version of gender bending. And you can see that she's wearing the kingly regalia. She's got on the crown of upper and lower Egypt, the crook and the flail, and the false beard. Oh well, yeah, it's the beard that's got me wondering. <laughs> <laughs> if she's a woman, how come she's got a beard? Well, it's a false beard. You can even see the straps at the side where it's tied on. What about body shape, though? These don't look like women's bodies. Uh, it's a, definitely a male body shape here. So she went with the male body for her statues, the male beard. Oh, I see there's a lot of face paint on these, too. What is the significance of that? Well, men were normally depicted as uh, with dark red skin, and women were shown with uh, either yellow or uh, pink. So the dark red face paint, the fake beard, the male body, the crown, the scepters. This says Hatshepsut was a king. That's right. Could Nefertiti also have ruled as king? Lila told me earlier that Nefertiti may have used the male name Smenkare as an alias. Is it possible she reinvented herself as Smenkare and succeeded her husband to the throne, just like Hatshepsut? This might explain the mysterious disappearance of her name from the historical record. But if Nefertiti was as powerful as Hatshepsut, why aren't there any monuments or tombs or temples to her? Male beard, 
Ted tells me that part of the answer may be right here on the walls of Hatshepsut's temple. And any of the clues that went with it. And over here, looks like this was also erased. That was erased by Thutmose III himself after Hatshepsut had died. An attempt really to suppress the memory of Hatshepsut as though she'd never existed. In some places, her name has been replaced by that either of her husband or her father. It's kind of like what we saw at Amarna with the, the etchings that are taken out of Nefertiti in Akhenaten. Yeah, a similar idea of changing history, of rewriting it, as it were, so that it reflected what was considered proper. Could this revisionist approach to history have caused Nefertiti's apparent disappearance? There's evidence that the Amarna tombs were defaced, and also the coffin, which may have belonged to Smenkare, or Nefertiti's husband, Akhenaten. Was Nefertiti erased from the historic record, too? But who would want her gone so badly, and why? The place to answer these questions is Karnak, the Hall of Fame for Egypt's greats. Isn't this wild? Look at these pillars. Each one, the legacy of the kings and queens of Egypt and the gods they represented. The question is whether I can find Akhenaten and Nefertiti in their rightful place among them. I'm going to visit some of the most secret haunts in Karnak. In my search for Queen Nefertiti, I've traveled the Nile from Amarna to Cairo to the Valley of the Kings. All I've found are a few sparse traces that Nefertiti lived at all, but nothing even close to the legacy of a great and beautiful Egyptian queen. If there is a memorial to her life, this is where I'll find it. This is Karnak, part of ancient Egypt's capital called Thebes. During Akhenaten and Nefertiti's reign, Egypt was a superpower, and it was here, at the temples of Karnak, where its rulers sought to leave their mark. Once again, I'm teaming up with archaeologists Ted and Lila Brock, who've been helping me solve this mystery. Hey, Josh. How are you? Hey, nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Ted? How are you, my man? Pleasure. You ready? Yeah. These are the That's temples built by the great pharaohs of ancient Egypt. Karnak was the heart of their religion, where each tried to build a bigger, better tribute to their gods. But something's missing. I don't see any evidence that Nefertiti and Akhenaten built a temple here. Ted tells me the reason is hidden right here, in this massive structure called a pylon that was built after they died. Several years ago, the restoration work was being carried out here, and they found that it was stuffed full of the uh, talatot, the building blocks that Akhenaten used to construct his temple, used as filler inside the walls of these two towers. He's trying to hide the whole memory of Akhenaten and his cult, and Nefertiti and the Aten. Not just erasing it, but burying it. Yeah, because if these, if these walls had never collapsed, we wouldn't have known what was inside. No, it'd all still be hidden away. These are the so-called Talatot blocks that Akhenaten and Nefertiti's temple was made of. A pharaoh who succeeded them literally destroyed it block by block. But it seems even that wasn't enough. The pharaoh wanted Akhenaten and Nefertiti gone for good. So he hid the blocks deep inside the pylon. For 3,000 years, there was no trace of the king and queen's existence. More of their story remains locked away in this storage shed. Um, it's very rare that anybody ever gets into it. It's because I'm with you? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> After you. No, thank you, sir. Oh, you're welcome. Come around to the left. This is where they keep all the good stuff, huh? Yeah, this is all the important blocks, decorated uh, thousands of blocks here. It really is just bits and pieces that are left. That's all it is. They aren't assembled in any sort of order or random. anything. It's just all very random. It's like a big jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all messed up. And uh, somebody lost the box top. These blocks contain the hidden history of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. They're engraved and painted with images that tell the story of their life and let's, reign. Let's see if we can find a Nefertiti. They're bits and pieces. Uh, here's, this might but they be must first. be reassembled in the correct order for the drama to play out like a movie carved in stone. This is Nefertiti here. 
That's her head, her face. And she's wearing two feathers on her head as a crown. The story in these blocks promises to be an epic tale of how the most celebrated couple in the ancient world was almost condemned to everlasting anonymity. Wow, so this, this is the actual paint. Yeah, a lot, they were all originally painted. Really, it's an unsuccessful attempt to erase the memory of Aten and Akhenaten and Nefertiti. As we walk through Karnak's great monuments, one question still remains. Why did Akhenaten and Nefertiti's successors so thoroughly annihilate all trace of their legacy? This place is huge. Yeah, if you really want to get a good overview of it, I know a secret passage we can go into that'll take us up above here and we can look over the whole place. Secret passage? Yeah. Lead the way. Okay. <laughs> Full of interesting things like bats, maybe snakes and scorpions. Lovely. The way I like my secret passages. Oh yeah, look, here's the bats. Yeah. Oops, we just ran into it. Ah, it's like, what are you doing here? How you doing? There you go. That was fun. Ah, fresh air. A bat actually landed on me. Exploring Karnak has shed some light on just how important religion was in ancient Egypt. Could this have had something to do with the destruction of the temple? Tell me what I'm seeing, Ted. Well, this temple has been built over many generations. The uh, columned hall of Seti and Ramses. You have, for example, obelisk of Hatshepsut there. This uh, big enclosed courtyard here and the pylon we're standing on of, of a later date. So each time there was a new ruler, he or she would seek to leave their mark by building a temple here. That's right, all to the glory of Amun. But Akhenaten and Nefertiti worshipped a different god, called Aten. And their temple to Aten would have been a legacy fit for a king and queen who ruled the most powerful nation on earth. But another pharaoh destroyed it. If this is supposed to be where kings leave their legacy, why would someone destroy their temple? Well, Akhenaten closed down the temple of Amun. They set up a rival cult to the sun god Aten, suppressed the worship of Amun at the same time. So those are two different gods. That's right. Amun and Aten. That's right. And I suppose you'd say it was sort of vengeance on the part of the priesthood of Amun when the old way was restored after Akhenaten died. That they would erase Akhenaten's name, Nefertiti's name, and their images, demolish their temples. Sort of as an act of uh, reprisal. So they were heretics? Certainly they were considered heretics by later generations of pharaohs, yes. That's right. And so while he's pharaoh, because he's pharaoh, everyone has to respect his wish. Yes. And so they're building these great temples for him, and everyone's sort of playing along saying, well, he's pharaoh, we have to do what he says. But right. when he dies, they say, sorry, we're not following that god anymore. Mm -hmm. Our god's back in power, and we're going to destroy your temple and everything you stood for. That's about what happened. Yeah. So it was all a monumental case of payback. No wonder it's been so hard to find Nefertiti's tomb, or mummy, or almost any trace of her life. Though we know so little about her, the few glimpses we do have reveal an ambitious woman who shook her nation to its very foundations. Even now, 3,000 years later, controversy still swirls around Nefertiti, and we never get tired of contemplating her life and death. She keeps us captivated, searching dark tombs, excavating ruins, and digging for the truth to unearth the secrets of Queen Nefertiti.